This meeting is being, being recorded. recorded. Good evening, everyone. It's lovely to see you all again for the final show of this format. But don't worry, there is more. There is a YouTube channel. The link will be going into the chat throughout the show so you can't miss it. Go check us out, subscribe, like the videos, watch the videos that are there, and put on that little bell thing so you get notifications when we post videos as well, which is going to be two or three times a week. We're going to try and maybe do a little bit more I to start it off. I didn't know there was a bell on YouTube. Yeah, well, you've got the little subscribe button. There's a little bell next to it. It's a bell. If you press that bell, whenever a video gets posted by that channel, you get notified. Do you know what? I'd like to take people out on outdoor experiences, and one of them is uh, actually looking um, and, and seeing. And obviously, when I look at YouTube, I don't see. Well, clearly, you're not <laughs> observative enough. Observative? So... <laughs> Talking of observing things, let's do an observation. An observation. This week I've had uh, I had an entertaining meeting last night. I'm not going to go into any great depths about that entertaining meeting, but it's funny because it just brought a couple of things to the forefront of my mind. It's funny how when something comes up, we tend to make it far worse in our imaginations, in our minds, than we need to. And it's funny also how these things are never as bad when we actually go out and do them, whatever that thing is. And last week I was talking about the four attentions and it kind of brought me into a real prominent example of the first two of them. So what I actually did yesterday, instead of, as I would have done many times in the past, making that event a much, much bigger and a much, much worse event, thinking up all the disasters that could happen, all of the catastrophes, and making it into a massive, massive issue and a massive, massive problem. I spent all day going, actually, I don't want these thoughts. I don't like these thoughts. They're not helping. Actually, actually say, no, it won't be like that. And actually thinking through various scenarios, thinking how that they might work, and thinking how I can address those, and looking for, no, it will be positive, it will be cool, and it will be okay. And the beauty of that, actually, was the fact that I didn't get all of that kind of anxiety that we quite often get through the day, managed to function well and properly through the day. And I was really, really pleased about that. Went and had the meeting yesterday. And unfortunately, it was every bit as I was horrible as I was thinking it might be. But do you know what? Because I've been working on my state of being in now, rather than worrying about the future or whatever, I managed to function and be really calm all the way through that meeting. No matter how it went, stay calm. And I was really pleased about that. And then when everything did go very, very wrong at the end of it, still together. And I was still calm. And it was actually a really good feeling that I hadn't let the thoughts that aren't helpful get hold of me. And that's one of the really important, that's the second of the attentions is actually only holding on to the thoughts that are useful and are positive. You need to pay heed to those that aren't, his, you know, that aren't helpful, but just observe them, take them on board, give them the attention they deserve, and then let them go. And it really, really does work because you can't have those emotions if you don't have those thoughts. So therefore, for me, those four attentions are absolutely brilliant. So just to quickly recap, first one, be in the now. Don't be in yesterday, don't be in tomorrow. Second, just choose the thoughts that you need that are helpful and positive. The third one is look for the learning in everything. And I will be uh, you know, updating some of my processes within the business according to the situation that we had. Um, and you know what? It's about movement. It's about moving your mind. It's about moving your state of emotion. It's about moving your body. And it all works. And you know what? Every single thing we do is a chance to experience another asset of life. And what better way to move forwards? Taking things as an example of an experience of life, moving back on to task, 
you might have noticed we have a fairly prominent logo, which is on everything we do. You might have seen this, this chaff inch. Oh, we've had a question. What was oh. the second attention? The second attention is where you actually uh, hang on to the positive thoughts, the helpful thoughts, where you just acknowledge the ones that aren't helpful and deal with them in any way you have to and then let them go and just keep hold of those positive thoughts, looking for the positive ways of making things positive. Because if you don't think about the negative stuff, you don't have the emotions. So the second attention is to just be aware of what you're thinking. Huh. Yeah. Back so, to where we were. Back to where we were. No, it's cool. If ask me it's anything. If it's a question that you want to ask and you need the answer, ask it always. Um, Chaffinch. We've actually, I actually got some video when we were in the Lake District of a Chaffinch, uh, pretty close and singing. And we we didn't use it and didn't use it. And when we, we knew we were coming up to the last of the shows in this format, we thought we need to do a feature on the Chaffinch as a kind of, you know, a plant animal of the week feature because it is so prominent. Now, Probably if we show the video first, and yeah, then we can have our, video. Uh, yeah, shut me up for a minute. And uh, this is from Falshaw Moss in the Lake District, and a bird we can get anywhere, but I just got close. Enjoy this. got on there because I didn't think I put any music on. anyway doesn't matter so chaffinch you'll notice pink breast and it sounds like a 70s car horn sort of do -do 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 and it's funny because when you actually clock that bird song you suddenly realize that chaffinches are everywhere you don't see them hugely unless you're looking but you'll hear them all over the place sort of do -do 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 there's one comment here saying, Anyways. I had a chaffinch at my bird bath this week. Beautiful. Superb. Superb. So, why have we got a chaffinch as our logo? That's the real one. And the story actually starts in Wales. Last February. February in 2020. Wales. 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 Yeah, that place over there that Ali G would sell if we had any debts, if he was Prime Minister. The West Side. <laughs> Um, starts in Wales. We were staying in in a cottage with some friends of ours who have a cottage in Wales, and we'd gone to Lake Vrumwy. It was one of those days where you get all four seasons in one day. Had, lately. Yeah, we, we've had a few, but we did. We had snow, we had sunshine, we had rain, we had wind. All of them were there, and it was so. It was February. We went to the cafe at uh, Lake Vrumwe. It was great. I had a cream tea. I was a bit, a bit partial to the old cream tea. Too partial, uh, some might say. Sometimes, yeah. But I have, I have, I'm eating a lot less lately. So, anyway, after we'd had our cream tea, we went across to the bird hide. And in front of the bird hide, there's a load of feeders. And we got there, there were a lot of chaffinches and a lot of siskins. And they'd been, they were having a bit of a barney from time to time. Well, I bet the third picture that I actually took was of a, a siskin was on a feeder and this chaffinch was doing its level best to scare it off. But I actually managed to get a picture of the chaffinch with its wings out. Uh, and it looked pretty amazing. I mean, I took about another 200 pictures <laughs> while we were there and not one of them was even remotely close. So 
But I mean, everybody who saw it was there at the time said, wow, that's an amazing picture. That's really cool. You should use that as a logo. And I'm like, yeah, okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah, you know? I don't know when you used it as a logo. I'm, but uh, I'm, I'm a little bit confused as to where where and when it ever got used as a logo. It's a bit of, a, bit of an odd one, isn't it? Yeah. Um, anyway, straight over your head. Absolutely straight over my head. I've got no idea what he's on about. Um, so what we actually did when we came back, there's a thing called a snipping tool on on a P, on a Mac PC, whatever. Just took the bit of the chaff inch out of that picture, dropped it into AutoCAD that I'll use it for, for my garden designs and stuff. And did a little bit of artistic jiggery pokery because actually the chaff inch in the picture was in a quite aggressive pose. So I kind of shut its beak and just took a little bit of the edge out of the picture and used it as the logo that we see. Pretty cool birds, Jeff Inches. Um, gutsy little fellas, as in this case. But anyway, you've got some facts, I believe. I have. Now, I've been doing some digging because, you know, I do like to find some interesting, strange, and sometimes odd facts. So I've brought some with me this evening. So we all know as the Chaffinch, but it has different names or known as county names in other places. Now, can anyone have a guess at what any of them might be? There are three that which are most common. There are a lot more, but they're nowhere near as common, apparently, as these three are. I didn't know there were any other names for it. Well, maybe if you told tell us the you. name and then we try to guess where it came from. I couldn't tell you where they're from. All oh, right. But we can always have a guess. So the first one for a chaffinch is a pink twink. I've never heard of a pink twink. I can think of one or two places where you might use it, but not with a chaffinch. Second one is a chink chaffy. That sounds Somerset, doesn't it? It does. A, a farmer kind of yeah, thing. Satin trarry. Yeah. Oh, it's going to end up being a show of accents at this weight. Right. At this weight. At this rate. At this weight, typically. And the last one is pinkery. I might have heard that one. Well, there are three. Now, I have not, I'm not entirely sure where they're used, but they're the three most commonly used. I mean, I, I see the chink chaffy one. I'm not entirely sure about the other two. If, if they'd ever met. I don't well, think I'd ever see a chaffinch and go, that's a pink twink. I mean, but, they, they do go kind of twink as an alarm call. Kind of shrink. Shrink. Yeah, potentially. But I also have another interesting fact. Well, go on then. Fact number two. two. Fact number two. So, originally, chaffinches would be trapped and used in what they used to call mating call wars. Where in the 1700s, they would use chaffinches by caging them. They would then have uh, mating wars where they would put out their song. And who, which, whichever one they decided was the loudest, that one won. Okay. But trapping, tra trapping chaffinches became illegal in 1896. So that was when the end was put to that. And in caging chaffinches was banned. Good. So we could finally see them all out in the wild again. Bit of Victorian conservation. And I've got another one. I've got another very interesting fact. Talking about mating calls, a male chaffinch in the spring per day will sing its mating song on average around 3,000 times a day. God. That's a lot. Those just have it on repeat. All day. Can you imagine three thousand times? I suppose you know. Fancy a point, you might manage. Fancy a point, love. Oh, fancy a chip, love. We were talking about a chaffinch being in someone's garden earlier. Well, I did some digging as to where or what you need to have in your garden as an ideal space for chaffinches to be. So 
I have found that for chaffinches to be in your garden quite prominently a lot of the time and have quite a prevalent space in your garden, you need to have oak trees. You need to have a fair chunk of woodland slash shrubbery in your garden for them to sit in, but apparently their favourite tree to go to is an oak, and that's where they mm. have most commonly been spotted. We haven't got an oak tree. We haven't got an oak tree. We've always got a fair amount of shrub. We've got a lot of shrub. We've got a lot of shrub. A lot of shrub. Yes. And my final fascinating fact, you know, because he's been so riveting, is chaffinches will only breed one clutch. So unlike when we did the sparrows, when they'll do two or three, potentially four clutches. Or blue tits. They will only do one clutch. And on average a year, there are four birds to that clutch. So there are potentially, on average, each year, another four chaffinches. Well, that infers, really, the world. when you think that each adult needs to have at least one surviving offspring, that they're better at looking after their youngsters than sparrows are. Well, <clears throat> oh, we have a lot of woodland next to our garden. That would probably make a lot of sense as to mm. how or why you've, you've seen chaffinch in your garden. Definitely. But those are my interesting chaffinch facts that I've found. Well, here you go. We better move on in this this fact because we, we've got a, you know, a last minute addition to the agenda. This is one that, that kind of appeared quite randomly this morning. I wasn't expecting this at all. Now, we have got a PowerPoint slide afterwards. We're not going to tell you what this bird is, uh, but you've probably heard me say several times in the last few weeks, I've been really, really trying to get some video. Well, I've got a little bit this morning. Uh, we did even zoom in a little bit, but the song is there, and there is one little shot where you can see how it got its name. But... Um, enjoy this because I was a bit macy. It's a Start for five. Anyone got any idea what that might be? It's a, it's a summer visitor. They're migrants. They uh, overwinter in, in Africa. Um, wagtail. It's not a wagtail. Not a wagtail. Um, they are, there is a, the name is, is white, based white on... White snack? Uh, it's not a white snack. No. It's not a lion bar. No. Or a Milky Way. Um, they are actually, or they are Way. called white throats. So white was good, um, but they've actually got a very, very white throat. But once you clock the song, it is a scratchy little number. Then they're very easy to recognise where they are. But it's funny, they are really, really flighty. They will alight at a far greater distance from us than, than many of our local birds. You know, robins and blackbirds and chaffinches to some extent will let you get quite close, but the white throats won't. So as you can see, the, the, the shot was a bit jumpy because I had the phone was on maximum zoom, which was the first section of the video. And then the second bit was where I kind of zoomed the video in a bit further. And there was one little bit where you can see the white throat. There is actually another bird, which is quite similar, and that's called a Lesser white throat. Would you like to give them the, uh, the picture? Uh, but one of the things that you do see when you actually see them is they quite often will do that, um, that make the song. They'll do a little song flight and they'll kind of go up in a kind of oval with a narrow at the bottom and they'll go up and do that narrow little song flight and then they'll come back down again and sit on the bush. But you can see quite clearly 
they're called a white throat because they've got a white throat. Um, so when you're out and about now, if you hear that scratchy song, have a little look for the white throat because they are quite a pretty little bird. And so we just get them in the summer and yeah, just pick out the scratchy song. So well, talking of summer, talking of summer, it, it might, well, it might currently outside not quite look like it, but we are in summer and we are past the start. We are at the end. So last, we are at. Yeah, we're at midsummer. Huh? Well, we just passed it. Monday was midsummer. Uh, not that we saw any sun on Monday. In fact, I would, I would have got up at dawn if there had been any chance of seeing the sun. Didn't get up. And I would have gone out and watched the sun set had there been any chance of seeing the sunset. But as we didn't see any sun on Monday, we just saw a torrential downpour. And I was home yeah, by lunchtime. We did indeed. And, but as she went out and did the first of the guided walks we did on Sunday, the five senses had a fantastic day. The weather really did play ball. And it was, it was just really cool to get out, get out with some people and, and work through. There's actually a fantastic testimonial being put up today on the Simple Life Circle Facebook page. So that's really, really cool. And what was even more interesting is afterwards is, We'd actually teamed up with Ellie and Hannah from Phoenix Sound Baths. They did gongs and crystal bowls and things and whatever else. And we spent an hour and a half, I can't believe it was an hour and a half, just in this big kind of like sound of the, of the gongs and everything else, uh, with the sounds kind of fading in and fading out. And it was kind of really kind of spiritual midsummer experience. So keep your eye out for other bits and pieces. I think we've got a we will just show you we've got the, the walk on the 17th of July, Saturday, Oxney Church. Uh, tickets are now on sale for that one. The mo I believe it's one of the most haunted places locally, but we've actually got access with uh, to get into there. So if anyone's interested in that, please book up. But uh, I shot this video on Saturday, midsummer weekend, and it's one of those where we just get what nature shows you, shows us. Haven't gone overboard with the narration. We've just put bits and pieces together and uh, it kind of snaps up midsummer colour and midsummer life. And uh, it's pretty cool. So enjoy this little snap of midsummer. Hello, Simon here. Behind me is the old parish church of Betsanger, which has now been bought by Betsanger prep school but uh come out and had a little wander around the estate on this midsummer weekend typically in this country for midsummer the sun's gone the clouds come out we've had a fair amount of rain but the world is still a magical place so enjoy the video enjoy midsummer and be at peace
I'm actually called that video putting your hands on history because the two big, big trees are both old. One's actually considerably older than the other. The, the first big tree is actually a beach. And if you look, as, as we went in, there are actually beach mast that, that were kind of growing on the, the trees. And shortly after that, well, we started off kind of like down in with the, the honeysuckle and, and, and then went kind of upwards. We went into an oak tree there. And you can see that quite clearly with those kind of very kind of like round sectioned leaves. And as that one went through, then there was a, a holm oak, an evergreen oak in the shot as well. But that very final one, when we came down, that really, really rough, kind of almost jagged bark was an oak tree. Um, and oak trees can live a really long time. They can live several hundreds of years. And when they are big and they are old, that bark is rough and it's hard. It's kind of warm. It's if if you're kind of to fill it with a into a quilt, you could possibly sleep in it as a sleeping bag. But uh, amazing trees. You think you know our armada or our fleet that beat the Spanish armada was pretty much built out of oak trees. So it's a, a pretty important tree for our history. But um, few comments. Few comments. The giant tree looks like a giant foot. I do, I guess. It's whatever you kind want of, to interpret it to be. I kind, of, kind of entish, really. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, entish. And it loves the music, very fitting. Thank you. Well, wow. take the compliment. We do like Midsummer, but we also do like to learn new things. So, I will welcome to the stage our guest for this month, which is Phil. So, so Phil, Phil is Mr. History in Dover. <clears throat> he's, he's the man you speak to for the Western Heights and, and the Drop Redoubt and the Citadel. Uh, he's a man, he's an author, and uh, he's also an occasional uh, TV star. And um, tonight he's a, he's the uh, Simple Life Circle Zoom star. So again, just any questions in the chat for Phil or we'll save them for afterwards. Uh, we were told him he can have at least 15 minutes. So if he's on for 25, we're not going to get upset. Um, but a big, big circle, silent round of applause for Phil. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, <laughs> oh, God, I can see myself. That's quite horrible. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think some of you probably know me and know the site rather at the Western Heights um, in Dover. Well, you could talk for hours and hours and hours about the Western Heights, so I will promise to try to be 15 minutes if I can, which really narrows down what you can talk about, really. So I thought I'd just to show you a few pictures of um, what our site is all about and then do an a incredibly flying positive history of the site to show you some nice photographs of it as it was and uh, some, you know, some of the men who were up there. Okay, so I'm sure you all know where it is. I'm sure you all do. So I won't bother with all that. If anybody doesn't, just ask. Okay. All right. So I've not done this before. So let me try and work out where to share my now share screen. Ah, there we are. Um, there we are. I'm not very technical, I'm afraid. That's it. Can you all see that? Yeah. It's on the screen, Phil. We can all see. Hooray! It. Right. Okay. Good. Okay. What do we do? That's a good question. Um, right, we're all a bunch of volunteers. Absolutely none of us get paid to look after the site at all. Uh, none of us do. We just, we just, we've all got different jobs. I'm actually, for reality. And for example, I'm actually immigration officer in the real world. I don't tend to talk about that publicly. It's a bit of a hot topic at the moment. So we've all got different jobs like this, and some of the prison service, and some of, you know, just, just all sorts of backgrounds. But anyway, we're a bunch of volunteers and meet up one, usually once a month. We just restarted after COVID on the um, well, last Sunday, every third Sunday at the Drop Redoubt Fort in Dover. What we do is we look after the old site. Uh, but our aims of that, we, we basically chop down trees and things, and we'll come off that in a minute. But the aims of our society are to look after the site, preserve it, publicise it, talk about it, hopefully appear on TV or whatever, or produce books and things, just sort of raise public awareness of it and of course research it which is the one of the things that i sort of do 
So let's have a look. Now that is a nice photograph that was taken in 1939, just before war broke out. And what you're looking at, you're actually above the Citadel, looking back towards Dover. You can see the harbour in the background. The Citadel, some of you will know as uh, probably the Ballstall in Dover. Um, or the Young, Young Offenders Institute, more recently, Dover Immigration Removal Centre that shut about five, six years ago. And it's now known as, in private hands, known as the Tech Fort. But there it is at the bottom, as you can see it. It is absolutely enormous. It really is. Um, we don't look after the Citadel. It's too big. The bit that we look after is the drop out. You can just see the very top of the picture and the grand shaft staircase. As you can see, the whole site covers 140 odd acres. And it's uh, about, you could fit Dover Castle and all its grounds into it two and a half times. It's that big up there. It really is. It's enormous. So there's 15 of us in a wheelbarrow. So <laughs> anyway, so there we go. As you can see now, you can, I'm showing that one there because you can see again, 1939 from the other view dropping down to the bottom. Look at the amount of what we did look like, what it looks like now. Look at all the trees that have sprung up. You know, it's uh, that so... Obviously, back at the time it was built, back in, well, you know, 200 odd years ago, you didn't want tree cover up there because that would have obstructed artillery fire and uh, provide cover for the enemy. So it's completely clear, clear with new trees. And look at it now, it's uh, smashed to pieces in places, other bits are quite well preserved, a bit of a patchwork, really. There's our little bit, which I'm sure most of you have probably been in before. This is a little corner outlying artillery platform, really, at the end of the heights. Grand Shaft Staircase, which is that's uh, 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 on Snargate Street, of course. 140 foot triple staircase built about 1806 to 1809 to three years, and it's unique. There's nothing like it in the world. There's one in um, Spain which is taller, but it's only a double, and now it's a triple, which makes it perfect. Really, it's lovely. I recommend walking down it, not walking up the blooming thing. <laughs> okay. Let's have a look, moving on. Other bits we look after, north entrance. This is, uh, some of you may just about recall the old roadway. That's an old tunnel that runs right through the centre near the drop redoubt to connect up and goes up towards St Martin's Battery at the top. And that was the old roadway before the cutting was built in 1970 to drive up now. And that's the old military tunnel. And you can see even now, you can st we still got part of the old, the old drawbridge. It's, it's permanently fixed in position now. It was quite a load of uh, three and one oil to get that running again. But you know, it's all in its issue still. So that's quite nice. That's quite well observed. We also work out in the north lines as well, which is uh, are again a ditch that runs between the redoubts and the north and the cutting, and the, and the military road cutting. Again, that's just us. Well, what, after a, after a couple of work days in the winter, um, where we cut down the trees, you can see. And of course, the trouble is vegetation has a horrible habit of growing again. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it doesn't look like that anymore. But I'm sure perhaps this winter now we're back to having work days. Perhaps we can make it look like that again. Okay. There's some of our work days. There's uh, old Marcus and Andy Rayner and a couple of others there. That's inside the north entrance tunnels. And, um, and small gun rooms. And there's some of our work volunteers, you can see, after having cut down lots of trees in the winter. Um, it doesn't really show up brilliantly, but you get some idea. There's a there's a then and now picture. You can see all the bricks lying on the ground. It looks like there's nothing actually there. When we were actually in there looking at it, there was an awful lot of bricks. So all that lot had to be carted out of that gun room upstairs and uh, and, and thrown into skips that cost us a couple of hundred pounds to hire for the weekend. So, but it looks quite nice and uh, nice and clean now in there. Again, that's in the north entrance tunnels. That is that is a that is a mid Victorian gun room. It's about 1860. That is that's a World War II paint on the wall there. Uh, oh, that one. Um, it's just us working in the moats, really. So uh, the ditches, I should say. Now that one is, and you might recognise this. This is actually in the drop redoubt. Um, in about 1959-1960, a lot of the, the front of the casemates in there were blown up I think by the Royal Engineers practicing and also the buildings opposite. So if you look at the top picture, that was taken about 2013. This is the masses and masses of bricks at the top. 
there's you know entire basic demolished building there at the bottom where it looks like afterwards when we cleared it all we cast all the bricks out and uh, put them into one of the casemates to get them out of the way so we've managed to uncover remnants of the old uh, mid-victorian cookhouse up there which is quite interesting so all looks very nice but it's quite hard work and one of our volunteers paul jones fabulous chap carpenter he has been making wooden floors inside the drop redoubt and that's a uh, base of framework foundation that he's he's a brilliant carpenter that he's created him and uh, i think his son put together and he's slowly working through and creating these flo those floating floors with an oak, oak um, planks on it and that's that, that's uh, quite nice we're not allowed to hammer anything into the actual structure because it's all of course a scheduled monument so that's uh being so you can see it's it's, it's lying loosely on well, I suppose joist is that the word? I suppose really, joist line there. Uh, so that, when it's fully planked, looks absolutely fantastic. And it's done about six or seven rooms like that. This is a replica uh, Victorian carronade gun that we had cast, and we've now installed it again in one of the gun rooms that dropped out to give the public an idea of some of the guns that were installed there. That's an actually an old Napoleonic gun, but it was brought back into use in the 1860s when the fort was rebuilt. So the hauled out these old guns for their in storage but the navy didn't want them anymore they're the perfect for ditch defense so imagine that full of um like canister and shrapnel things like that really to fire out the wind fire out the, the, you know, the gun holes um and you can sort of anybody standing in any frenchman standing in the boat would, would really stand a chance in front of one of those things but that's uh, just an example of all the little bits of, sort of reconstruction that we've done ah yeah <laughs> yes well i forgot that was in there <laughs> That's, again, there's, there's, there's our gun, which has all been painted up, and it's quite nice. And a couple of um, Victorian gunners with a couple of mannequins that I managed to get hold of with a couple of original uniforms as well. I don't think that was supposed to quite happen like that. <laughs> uh, okay. Yes. Uh, tours, yeah. There's, uh, there's Mandy on the right, Mandy Wall, giving a tour to RF cadets. Oh, sorry, the, the Army cadets. Oh, they are RF cadets, aren't they? You've got the blue berries on. Um, yeah, we do that. Any school groups in the summer, we're more than happy to just drop us a line. You know, any cadet groups come up, whatever you like, really. We're more than happy to give tours to. We don't charge a penny. You know, we do it all for free. We don't want any money off anybody. We just want people to talk about the site, really. So, again, if you'd like to do anything like that, again, just drop me or Mandy, the secretary, a line. Um, you know, if anybody wants more details, more, more than happy to pass it on. Or Liverpool or Facebook, of course. Events uh, once a year or so, or twice a year, usually May and September, we have uh, events. We have um, read actors come up there inside the fort, and <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> read actors come up inside the fort, usually the Polyonic reactors, but also First and Second World War, they do displays of gunnery, musketry drill, um, some living history sort of reenactors showing what you know how rooms kitchens would have worked and bring up their pots and pans and things like this really again we don't take ourselves incredibly seriously so we do have quite a laugh at these events we have a steampunk groups come up as well and all sorts of other people so uh, and uh, oh yes there's dan <laughs> dan elliott our very very funny first world war sergeant up there um it's great because he's very, very informative. He knows his subject back to front, and he's got his perfect delivery of, of comedy and learning at the same time. And those who watch Sharp, the wonderful old series about the Polonic Wars, on the right will notice Jason Salkey. He played Rifleman um, Harris up there. He's, he's our, actually our, uh, our president now. So he sometimes he often comes along and signs some pictures and things and talk to anybody about the film. He's Sharp. Very nice fellow, very, very approachable fellow indeed. So again, so what else we got oh yeah well that was one event we did um, about four or five years ago that was wonderful that was the halloween event to decorate the fort with pumpkins and, and skeletons and play creepy music and do projections of ghosts flying around which was superb really enjoyed, enjoyed that one perhaps one day we can run it again we haven't done it for quite a while because english heritage changed the bat hibernation dates they decided that they would be a hibernating in October, so they knocked October out for us after we did one one Halloween event, which is a real shame. We'd love to have done more, but uh, the bats actually aren't hibernating until November, so we're a bit miffed by that. But don't tell any heritage. Perhaps one day we can bring it back. Um, oops, what did I click there? Oh yeah, oh yeah, more Halloween events. There's a 
Oh, it was Christy Norman's Wally Dog and a couple of zombie soldiers and uh, some ghost tales going on as well. Uh, oh, yeah, but immediately, yeah, um, like to, if we can, put stories in the papers, we can about it, what we've been up to, um, highlight the place. And, uh, oh, what we got here? Oh, yes, that, oh, yes, Michael Portillo, that's right, yes, on the right hand side. That was Great British Railway Journeys five, six years ago. He's a nice fellow, he was actually. It was very interesting in the site. He was asking lots of questions when the when um, uh, the cameras weren't rolling as well. So, we could, could, you know, he was, he, was, he was very keen. You know, he was quite a nice fellow. On the right, that's uh, Maureen Lippman, there's Mandy, and Larry Lamb, who did a, I think, of course, a program called Forgotten Heritage or something like that, or Lost Sites of Britain. They came up and filmed up there. Or a little as man as a hatter, of course, but I might um, <laughs> I got a clue what she was talking about, but she's very nice. Larry Lamb was very, very keen again, a bit like you know, Marco Portillo. He was walking around talking, he was a very, very nice fellow, very interested in the site. It's quite genuine as well. Oh, it's a couple of books there, you want to read about those are the ones that I did. Moving on from them, <laughs> right? Oh, okay, right, history of the site. Okay, now, um, this is very, very quick. Uh, you can you can talk about this for a couple of hours. So let's talk a bit about history of the site. This is a postcard I've got of the, do we recognize it? It's the Grand Shaft, where you're standing on Stargate Street. So that building on the right here is reconstructed now to make a little office uh, by English Heritage in the 90s. There's the entrance to the Grand Shaft itself there in the middle. Um, You've got a, a, a rifle regiment on the right with, um, I'm not sure who they are on the left, it's hard to tell, definition isn't quite there, but they're doing a changing of the guard, which is great. A photograph's taken about 1906, 1907 roughly, but that's quite a nice one. Anyway, so the earliest works up at the Western Heights were dated way back in 1779, in fact. And that was, so what you're looking at there is the original plan for the defences of the Heights. Well, why in 1779? Well, 1779 was, of course, right in the middle of the American War of Independence. Now, so there was a worry, not that, of course, America would attack, because obviously it's too far away, but, of course, France was America's ally, and it was worried that the French were going to have a go, because they became our nemesis for quite a few years after that. So, these are the earliest plans of the, of the site that we know of, 1779. On the right, you've got the sort of idea the star-shaped shell for the citadel, shape for the cit citadel. On the right, you've got sorry, yeah, on the right you've got the drop down, which at that point was planned as like a uh, four-sided rectangle. And those are the lines you can see in the middle here, were lines of like trenches and gun batteries and things like that, sort of roughly connecting the two. The earliest phase was never actually finished. We think, as far as we can tell, some of these lines were dug. Uh, planks were put on side and, and guard houses were constructed here, 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 and one over at the drop redoubt. But it was never finished. Work was very slow. It was, it was very expensive, not much enthusiasm to finish it. So it wasn't really until Napoleon became a threat in 1803-1804 that they went back to the site and then restarted, redigging it and finishing it off. So that's what you're looking at today, really. So, so forget the 1779 stuff. There are vague traces of it, but really what you're looking at is primarily Napoleonic with Victorian. So as you can see, there's the Citadel. There's the officer's mess, that little building there. OK. Um, OK, we're going going to the left. We've got, uh, there's a housing estate now. So that's Heights Terrace, Knights Templar. This section at the middle is the fender point in the middle of those detached bastion. Uh, the kids will know it as smoky, they're always breaking into it. Oh, sorry, this nice temple, I beg your pardon there. And coming up there, here's the cutting I mentioned earlier, it was not through in 1970, that road there that goes all the way down past the Martins Battery car park, right down to the seafront. And of course, here's the drop redoubt. There was the site of the Grand Shaft Barracks, and the, the Grand Shaft itself was down this point, down here. So you can see it's absolutely massive. So here's a, an early depiction. This is a, not the Turner, but a Turner, Joseph M. W. Turner, painted this rather nice image. It's quite stylized, as you can see, it doesn't quite look like that. See the, the heights are far too high for Dover Castle on the other side, and we're not quite sure what's going on with this cliff down here. But it gives a nice idea, as that's wooden bridge, soldier, and the tiny little dog running across there as well, which is great to see. So that's a, a lovely, a very, very early depiction. 
This one is on the saluting battery, the drop redoubt. Again, we think this is, uh, we're not exactly sure, we've got a precise date for it, but we think it's about 1853, 1854. So as you can see, the fort itself was, at that point, I mean, the Royal Artillery only, hence the blue uniforms, okay? All artillery wore blue uniforms, infantry wore red ones. So all the men up there were in their blue uniforms with these small defensive guns that were placed here. Um, okay, now there's another one. Uh, this is, again, we believe on the saluting battery, the four, came from a newspaper cutting. Again, pretty similar, really. There's your, there's your little hut. These slabs are still here, actually. You got the, you can still stand on these slabs. A mortar to firing over into the harbour. And uh, some people watching the, I think it was the French at the time. Yeah, it was. The French were our friends at that point for a few years. And so we're actually in salutes that came up the harbour and just sort of, you know, just a, like a, 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 a triumphal salute, really acknowledging their presence, really. I'm sure the same sort of salute was going up in the castle up here as well. Um, in 1859, 1860, the French were no longer our friends again and became a worry. They never actually did anything against Britain, but there was a, a, a fear that they were going to. And so, um, under Napoleon III started posturing, he started uh, trying to, I think he, he, he invaded Austria and uh, moved to North Africa and things like this. Napoleon III was worried that he was going to attack Britain. And so, there's a big panic took place. And the Palmerston era, and it was uh, a big review took place of all the faults around the country, everywhere. And it decided, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> which forts were in good positions, they could, older ones they could keep, where there were missing forts, and which older forts need to be upgraded. So it's basically got rid of the old ones, build new ones, or update some of the older ones. So in Dover, they went back to the Citadel, which had been abandoned after Waterloo and finished it off. In the drop redoubt, they added these sections, these caponiers, ditch defence with guns, onto the, onto the Napoleonic defences, and updated the castle, of course. And then they built Fort Burgoyne as well, which I'm sure you know is up near Coral Barracks, because that, 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 that covered a gap on the sort of Canterbury Deal directions, heading in towards Dover uh, from that direction. So Fort Burgoyne was built. So actually Fort Burgoyne is about, it's about 60 years later than our forts at the Western Heights. But it's all part of what works as part of the same defensive overall plan. So at this point, uh, these are our typical armaments. We've got the four eighteen sixty eight. It was installed an Armstrong seven inch rifled breech loader. Unlike those earlier guns that you saw in that little uh, painting, which were loaded at the loaded at the muzzle, these were new technology and loaded at the back to the, the breech as opposed to the muzzle loaders at the front, really. And that had a range of about two or three miles, I think it was, and so they're quite useful for defending the approach of Dover from the sea. And also inland as well, pointed towards Folkestone in case the French landed at Romney Marsh and came walking up, well, marching up towards Dover to take Dover inland. So that's a, that's a typical gun that we were using to defend Dover in the late 1860s. 1892, this is the uh, uh, Braden Stone, which is the remnants of the Roman lighthouse. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, there is a Roman lighthouse at Dover Castle, the Pharos, by the curb, by the church. What's not so well known is we had an identical one at the Western Heights as well, marking the other side of the harbour for the Roman ships to to uh, come into the harbour. And so fortunately, it was all knocked down in about 1803, 1804, leaving nothing there. So this lump was then, uh, was then pulled out of the ground beneath where it did doing renovation works and dumped back on top to mark the point of the Western Roman Lighthouse, the Western Veros. And that became the ceremonial inauguration point for the Lord Warden of the Sackboards, where it actually had been in the 1700s as well, so they brought it back after they brought up these two lumps and dumped them in 1860 or so. So then we've got uh, the, the, what's his name, Marquis of Duchess of Ava, I think it was. Oh, no, but Dufferin, that's right, Dufferin, yeah. And there he is being installed as Lord Warden in the drop redoubt. So one of the hats of Mistoshis when you zoom in on that picture. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Grand Shaft Barracks, which overlooks Snargate Street. If it did overlook Snargate Street, it was all knocked down in about 1962-63. That's a wonderful shot looking up. So you get some idea of just quite how imposing the barracks were in Dover at that point. Massive. It held about 1,200 men up there, roughly, overlooking the pubs. 
And that row of pubs you see at the seafront was demolished again in the 1930s, I think it was, during the road widening. So they're all gone. There's some familiar names that people have looked up the history of Dover in there. It's like the Golden Anchor Hotel, the Wellesley Inn, Alexandra Dining Rooms, New Commercial Inn, and so on. So uh, usually full of uh, inebriated soldiers and sailors normally. <laughs> okay. Um, South Front Barracks, another set of barracks. That's uh, down South Military Road, where there's a freight park now. Again, demolished about 1959. These are a mid-Victorian set of barracks. Just before it was demolished, that photograph was taken. Quite sort of pokey, really, but fascinating construction. Not much known about South Front. It's a very, quite enigmatic because there's absolutely nothing to see of it now. It's all totally gone, which is a real shame. But that became a major point. Well, not about six, seven hundred men there all the way through from 1860 to uh, the 1920s, I think it was. I brought it back from World War Two, of course. Here's the military hospital, which is behind where my British engineering was in Dover, behind where the P&O building is up there. Again, the Palaeonic Hospital, that was um, used up until World War Two, of course. Uh, these extra wings, well, extra wings were built on after the Battle of the Somme because of all the wounded First World War soldiers came back into Dover were put, well, a lot of them were, were put into this hospital to, to try and recover before moving on to the bigger hospitals um, up in London and elsewhere. So that was a, that's also a very grisly site. Again, there's not much known about it. There are no traces of it whatsoever, which is a real shame. And the background, that up there is uh, Archcliffe Gate, which actually marks the point of St Martin's Battery Car Park up there. So again, all demolished. So nothing in that picture there is still standing, which is a shame. Here's the Citadel. Here's the officers' mess in the Citadel. Now currently under private ownership. Very, very impressive building. Uh, about 1860 odd. Uh, I used to work in there. We were on the Disturbing Invention Rural Centre. It's quite a good condition, actually, but they could do a lot of sense of loving care. <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah, collecting postcards and things. Sometimes postcards can really open up if you're lucky enough to find them on places like eBay and postcard fairs, auction sites. This is a nice one of 1911. This is the a rifle, co rifle cup for a shooting competition for the um, Warwickshires. I think it was the Warwickshire Regiment at the Grand Shelf Barracks. What's nice about that particular one is it's also reported in the Dover Express as well. So sometimes if you're lucky, you can match up sometimes names to faces and things and, and uh, you, 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 you consult old newspapers and things. Um, in the background, if you look there, you can just see a squad of soldiers marching with rifles straight past the Grand Shaft. There's the steps lead down to the Grand Shaft to stay in the background. So little postcards like that are actually quite invaluable sometimes. This is 1914. This is the week before war broke out. This is a wonderful photograph we've got. You might have seen it before. This is the best photograph we've got by far of the drop out when it was in use. This is the Corps of Drums, 1st Battalion, King's Own Royal Lancaster Regiment. Now, they, um, at that point, the artillery had long gone from the redoubt and it was relegated to the band's practice area, which is absolutely perfect for it. So this is wonderful for two reasons. One, because it shows what the fort looked like, because all these caves made here have all been demolished now. You don't see them, but they're empty like shells now. And of course, you've got washing hanging up there. And there's a bloke photo of them in there, if you can see. <laughs> okay. Um, and also, these men actually took part in the retreat from Mons in, uh, in, in, in late in August 1914. They arrived at the front 23rd of August, about three weeks after war broke out and suffered very heavy casualties at the Battle of the Cateau on the 26th. So uh, we know, for example, the Staff, Star Staff Sergeant Collins here was killed at the Battle of the Aisne in September 1914. This chap, uh, base trapper Johnson, was captured fighting bayonet points at the Cateau and spent four years in prison of war in Germany. And um, Drum Major Wilfred Thompson at the front here, he was wounded at the Battle of the Cateau, recovered, and uh, 1950 wrote a regimental history, which is how we know what happened to them. So that's a that's a nice photograph to see that one for two reasons. Now this is a typical photograph from World War One. Again, I wish we had more photographs, but this just shows to some extent of the. Uh, this is just so just half of the infantry garrison in World War One. These salaries of Grand Shaft. Uh, this photograph is about twice the size of a peacetime infantry battalion because, of course, what they were doing in Dover, like all the reserve regiments, were bringing men in, training them, and then sending them into the front in groups with a junior officer. So all these men here, virtually all of them, would have been either training for the front or actually be instructors. 
and there's a practice trench in the background up there as well, which you can see when you really zoom into it. Again, no trace of that tool, that's all buried under the housing estate now. Uh, and a photograph from World War II, of course, this again, the drop it out, you can see the front of the casemates are now all bricked in. And this shows famous commander and leader, Lord Lavat in the background. Um, that's Lord Lavat standing there um, and with the men number four commando and some Canadians about to go and do a beach raid to uh, Hardelow near Beloit. And this is um, 19th of April 1942. Uh, the A's are beach recognition mark on the back of his uniform so that when they're two o'clock in the morning they're running around to the beach near Beloit, one of the others has got a torch and we could, record, could form up on him because he's their sort of troop squad leader, if you see what I mean. This rifle here isn't an official rifle, it's a uh, Lord Lamatt's personal hunting rifle. The Captain David used to shoot stags in Scotland on his estate, and the Captain David Stull's carrying. And there's the famous commando dagger that he's got there, which is the Fairburn Sykes dagger. This thing, in case you're wondering, is a number 18 radio set. So, yeah, the Bredout did come back into life for five days in 1942 to hold commandos. This is the remnants of the Grand Shaft Barracks being demolished for a film called The War Game in 1963, I think it was, which is about a nuclear attack film, a nuclear, like a, like a drama documentary about a nuclear attack on Rochester. So this is a wonderful photograph that shows uh, the last, very last stage of the Grand Shaft Barracks which is undergoing demolition, which is why I got chosen as a film set, which is to double as a you know, destroyed Rochester. Um, yeah, it's a sad state, isn't it, to see it like that, really? You think, you know, 150 odd years of history and regiments and all sorts of things going through that building, just to see it demolished, it's replaced by Wasteland, or maybe even the Vera Lynn Memorial, if that's going to go ahead, who knows? I will show you this one because it's announced, it's, a, it's, um, it's, it's from behind the scenes from the same film. I'm showing you this one for one particular reason because this lady here is my mum. <laughs> That's my mother. Yeah, before I was before I was even thought of. Yes, yeah, so there she is. She was a film extra in it, uh, in the, in the um, firestorm sequences and uh, running around and panicking the big fan, you know, sort of blowing them in the streets and throwing paper up into the air and things like that, really. So there's mum. So she was a bit shocked when I showed her this. Oh, it's me, you know. <laughs> Dear mum, well, she's 79 now, so never in deal. Uh, I love, yeah, this one, this is exclusive, this one. No one's seen this picture before because I only picked it up two weeks ago. Very, very lucky to find this one. This is a postcard I managed to get off eBay for, it cost me about 17 quid, but it's a one-off. Uh, and actually shows the drop redoubt as well. As you can see, it's about 1922, 1923, the man of the 2nd Battalion, the Royal Irish Fusiliers. If you notice the background, can you see these arches? Of course, that's some two of the casemates. So I was really pleased, pleased to punch to get that one because we've only got so few photographs when the army are up there. In fact, I counted, apart from World War II, of the actual infantry, oh, the camera's done, we've only got eight photographs, including this one. So they're that rare, they are. So there's some tubular bells. And uh, yeah, so one, nice to pick that one up. And I'll just finish with this one, because I've probably talked them far too long. Does anyone know the story of Plassey the Tiger? You've heard of Plassey? OK, well, um, in 1870, the 102nd Royal Madras Fusiliers, who were an Irish regiment, came back from India, and they brought back with them their pet tiger. It was about three quarters grown and called it Plassey after a battle in 1757 where the British beat the French and the combined French Indian Army under Clive of India. That's what I named it. So they brought this tiger back to Dover <laughs> and actually kept him for about three months chained up like that in a pen under the citadel. So under the officer's mess of the citadel, they actually kept a Bengal tiger. And every single day, his sergeant used to take him on a walk on that chain into town right down the hill and march him around town, believe it or not, a loose tiger, you know, incredible really. Um, this caused a lot of panic in Dover, as you can probably imagine. There's an old lady apparently fainted when she saw this thing, it's recorded, and she wrote to the colonel and said, oh no, please, please, we've got to get rid of this tiger, it might attack him and kill me. And uh, shopkeepers started writing to the colonel too, because they were so frightened that this tiger was going, well, well, no, no, what happened is that the public was so frightened, they started shopping in Folkestone. So, <laughs> two cases of tiger attack them. <laughs> really, once it's all the express. So, a petition of shopkeepers and wrote to the colonel, can you get rid of the tiger? And he refused. The tiger never attacked anybody. Now, one day in uh, June, no, sorry, no, beg your pardon, it was 
no, I beg your pardon, it was August 1870. The Tigers' keeper, Sergeant Hartop, came staggering in, absolutely three sheets to the wind from the gates of the Citadel. And he went to sleep in the Tiger's pen. He, he escaped the guard, got through the guard, and went down to uh, into the Tiger's pen and went to sleep with him. The Tiger stood there, his paw and looking after him. So when the guard came in to try and retrieve the sergeant, the Tiger stood there and went, uh, snarled at them, you see. And, and so he, he's what tried to protect his, 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 you know, his, his, his friend, his keeper. And so the, 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 um, the uh, colonel decided, yes, OK, he has potentially shown some aggression. So they did remove Plassey from Dover and sent him to London Zoo. And there he lived for another seven or eight years or so, regularly visited by officers of the regiment. And in fact, if you go to the National Army Museum now, Plassey's skull is still on display after all these years. So Plassey's got a little bit of a... A little bit of history, but that's that's the reason why our society uses a tiger as its mascot. You might have seen photographs of some some poor person wandering around in a tiger costume, but that's why it's because it really was a Bengal tiger roaming around the heights, roaming around Dover for three months in 1870. We couldn't make it up, could you really? Uh, oh yeah, okay. So so there we are, really. So um, uh, oh, of course, it's me again. Um, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, so I hope that was sort of vaguely interesting. You should know it's a very, very quick potted history. Uh, yeah, so there you go, really. So uh, I hope that was okay. Brilliant. Uh, Bruce, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We, we let you run over solely on the fact of we're just finding out things that we never even knew were normally on our doorstep. But, I, mean, I, mean, I had no idea there was a tiger that lived in uh, Dover for three months. But it's also, I mean, I've been up to the drop we do on some of the events days when you've had the enactments people in shooting guns and making, a, a, and to actually, again, exactly as you said, to see the photos of the casemates with the fronts and everything else on them and in place is is yeah. pretty awesome, to be honest. Uh, so are any of the, I mean, there's a lot of tunnels, aren't there, around... The, the Citadel and, and various places because we've kind of like not quite had the bottle to go in one or two. It, it's quite interesting the way they kind of keep fencing them all off and then some unhelpful people keep going and unfencing yeah, them. Yeah, they do, yeah. yeah there's, there's the tunnels, there's not many there's no tunnels actually around the Redoubt not in our area there aren't really any tunnels uh, there's one that runs the back of St Martin's Battery and connects up to the Barrack site although there was a there was a cave in, um, it was actually used as a tunnel in World War II, it was a cave in, so you can't actually go through the whole thing. Uh, but yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the, the most the most damage has been done at the Citadel, although the Citadel's never been open to the public, it's survived quite well. There are three wonderful sets of tunnels into gun rooms at runs and Um We do know that after the Dover Immigration Rebuild Centre, the, the Home Office pulled out of there. The very day it pulled out, a lot of people broke into one of the tunnels and uh, graffitied and sprayed it and ripped an old gun port off the room, any, off the wall, any surviving one that there was in Dover, which is a real shame. But um, you, there's a lot more tunnels up around the castle there and actually are at the heights. It's surprising, actually, you think it wouldn't be. But, but yeah, I mean, urban explorers, are, I've got to be honest with you, urban explorers are okay, it's just the ones who cause the damage. If they go in and have a look, maybe photograph it, it's not too much of a problem, but it's the ones who cause damage. You know, there's the small, there's minority of them are the ones we've all got issues with, as we all have, you know. But, you know, it's... Yeah. Well, we've had a question come in. Uh, I'd love to visit the Western Heights. Are they open at the moment? Um, yes and no. I say that, and that's confusing. They, we're not having any open events we can't do this year because because of COVID. It's not just COVID, it's the fact that they, because we've had, not had a work day for 20 months, the site is totally overgrown. Or we did it was last Sunday. The last Sunday was the first one for 20 months, so it was totally overgrown. So this year we're going to spend like cutting it down, using damage limitation, bring back the public events next year. Having said that, of course, if anybody really wants to talk, it's not a problem. Contact me, contact Mandy. Drop us a private message on the Western Heights page. You know, of course, we'll give you a private tour. It's not a problem. So, in other words, we're happy to do like private tours under the restrictions, but there won't be any public events until next year. It's not our choice, but we all know what the situation is. Just one of those things at the moment. Cheers. I mean, you can you still walk around the outside of it? I presume. Oh yes, you can. Yeah, the, the redoubt. You can walk around it anytime. It's a public footpath. In fact. We like people to do that because they're walking dogs around there to stop the, to stop the, you know, the, 
uh, burglars, well, the vandals. So yes, of course you can walk around it all the time. Yeah. I mean, I say this, I'm talking about the redoubt, of course, um, the obstacle to Grand Shaft. You can walk around that bit. The Citadel is not open to anybody. Uh, it's going to be private ownership. You can't get into the ditch of the Citadel, though you can walk up around the whole thing and look at it, look down into it. You can't actually get into the Citadel, my wish, you know. <laughs> it's a fascinating place. Yeah, well, you, you, you can walk all over the outside, can't you? Because you can actually, the shot that you had at the officers' quarters, you can actually yeah. walk across the football field at the front. Exactly, yes, you can. Which is a pretty cool walk, actually. I've done that several times. Yeah. Kind of, you can actually almost feel the officers there, still kind of like the, the ghosts of them, sort of like almost still playing football. It's got that yeah. real sense of history to it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think what's quite nice about it is the fact it hasn't been sort of Disneyfied because a lot of it is still quite raw as it was when it was abandoned. You've still got that sort of... Uh, very evocative feel up there that you don't really have so much of the castle. The castle's just very commercial. Outside, well, they've had a massive amount of money invested into it outside there. We haven't, you know, it's just a few thousand pound here and a few thousand pound there. So it's a lot of it still, it was pretty much abandoned after World War Two. I think in many ways, in my mind, it has to its appeal. And also, it's not just the, the, the brickwork. You get the wonderful built, you know, two chats, particularly the wildlife up there. And the way we've got orchids everywhere up there. In fact, Mandy found some bee orchids yesterday on the sports field up there two days ago, which is wonderful to see, you know. Um, so we've got a wonderful butterfly population up there as well. Uh, adders, you know, um, I've never seen a grass snake, but I have heard that they are around there. So the wildlife is fantastic too. You know, it's, it's because it's unkempt, it's got that sort of... Uh, it's, it's nature of climbing. Yeah, yeah, that's the word. Yeah. It's, 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 it's when you actually get in to the, to the to the edge of the drop read out and you can see all those gun ports and you just kind of know that if anybody ever got in there it wouldn't have been a very long battle um and there is a kind of a kind of ghostly feel yeah when you when you walk around there kind of like it's just got a strange kind of edge edge yeah yeah you know, it's, it's eerie slightly, isn't it? definitely mm -hmm. eerie it's, it's it is it's Ask me, I like it. It's, I think the fact that it was never actually used makes it different as well. Well, yeah, I mean, having said that, I think what a lot of people forget is okay, obviously, it was built to defend Dover. I mean, clearly, that's its whole purpose. Although it was the French never attacked, it was used for well over a hundred years to train men. You know, all those who went on fighting, say, in the Crimea, uh, were, were um. You know, were, were, a lot of them were actually based in Drop Redoubt, for example, beforehand. That's how they learnt their skills. Uh, we had, um, I don't know if you know this or not, but of course the famous battles of Rourke's Drift in 1879 in the Zulu War and the massacre at East Sandwana. I only discovered um, about three years ago, and I was looking at small baptism logs, that the whole battalion, 2nd Battalion, 224th Regiment of Foot, who were famous at Rourke's Drift, were actually based at the Citadel to well, a year and a half before they actually went to South Africa. So they're actually, you know, those, those very men who, who were famous from the film stuff were actually training here in Dover and knew the pubs of Dover and were all local people. And in fact, you could say exactly the same with the, the Boer War and, of course, World War One. So, yes, I mean, you're absolutely right. Although it was never used for its intended purpose, the men there learnt their skill on site. You know, and it, it, they did it did for the very important sort of training function even if not actually a defensive function so that's where i sort of justify anyway <laughs> no that's yeah. cool that's absolutely brilliant phil oh, it's been so interesting having you on um Thank i think we've, had, we've we've well run over but it's been I'm worth sorry. every every run over moment uh and i'm sure for him i mean me personally i mean they mind everybody else <laughs> but um no, I'm sure that everybody would say the same. So thank you very, very much for coming on. And of course, the video will at some point be on YouTube. So you will be able to go and, and check yourself out, which would be cool. Is there any more, ch any more chat there? Uh, just one thing saying, can you post the website links and all of your links in the chat? So you could put in there your email, Phil, um, any Facebook links you want to put in, website links, anything, please feel free to do so. Or, um, or, or, or if you get them to us, we'll, we can email them out. Yeah, we can email them out and put them in a group. 
Yeah, we're on the Facebook group. We will uh, we will do that. So thank you very much, Phil. It has been amazing. Oh, Absolutely. pleasure. No, thank you for having me. Thank you. No, brilliant. So as as we kind of like announced and announced and announced, this is the last show in our weekly format. We'll be moving across to YouTube. Now, we're going to have a kind of dry run, see what happens evening next Friday. Um, we don't think it will be the most amazing viewing, but we're going to be working out what we do, how it works, how it goes on. Um, and then we'll be looking to have the first, if you like, of a new format will be on the 15th. That's Thursday, the 15th of July. Um, and we'll have a show packed full of something. Stuff. Stuff. Uh, we will be on YouTube. And we will make sure that before that, you've got all instructions that you need. Anything that will obviously help keep things moving swiftly and rolling over. Keep an eye on the Facebook group. Keep an eye on your email. Um, so one of those ways, there will be information you will need to find. Um, talking of information that you would like to find out and need to find. Uh, and the event on the 17th of July, is that part of the membership package? Um, it's the you, you would get 15% off if you book um, there isn't a, a discount code on the website but ultimately we know who you are and if you book we will make sure you get your 15% back okay uh, that will be happening the website is being upgraded we've just paid for the membership uh, function to be added to it so that is coming shortly um, there is a plethora well I say a plethora, there is four or five videos up on the YouTube channel now. So please feel free to check them out, watch them all. If you watch the whole video, it, it really helps us out. Um, it makes YouTube decide that we're actually amazing people and that we love exactly what we do. And we want to get, well, we want to reach more people. And for YouTube to do that, they need people watching full videos. So if you do, please just have 10 minutes a day. Um, just watch... A YouTube video. Um, the link is in the chat right now for the YouTube channel and just watch the videos for us because the more viewership we get, the more YouTube will push it out to a wider audience, which means we can get a bit more extravagant with the shows when we're doing them every month rather than doing them every week. We can get a bit more extravagant with the events and a little bit more extravagant with the content as well. So yeah. it's, it's a kind of you help us, we'll help you kind of situation, as it always is. I uh, actually went into Oxney Woods today and shot a little part of a, a promo video, which we'll be getting together and getting out shortly. But yeah, if if you can help us out getting people to subscribe to the YouTube channel, liking the videos, watching them, that's ultimately what it's about. We should be getting two out a week. Most weeks is the plan. Uh, Ross two is three. Yeah, Ross is planning to get newsletters out every fortnight. <clears throat> Um, and we'll be doing our best to get involved with as much Facebook and things as possible to look to bring things in. And of course, if you have any ideas, anything that you'd like us to try to incorporate, then let us know and we'll do the best that we can. But um, thank you for everything so far. Thank, thank you, you for, for sticking around. Yeah. Thank you for coming along. Thank you to Phil. Thank you to every other guest we've ever had. Uh, thank you to us for being here. Thank you to the fire for being here. Thank you for this lamp oh, illuminating us for the, the, the last six months. And yeah, and just we'll the see biggest you. thank you is to all of you guys that are here. Yeah, so, we look forward to seeing you on the 15th. We'll see you all very shortly on a different format. Okay, thank you once again.